As reported in the Capital Times, if Madison continues to grow at the rate that it has since 1990, the city's population is going to hit 355,000 by 2050. I suggest it's going to be bigger than that. Uh, Dane County's population is certainly going to top a million. Here's a two-part question. What do we need to do from an infrastructure perspective to help it grow responsible, responsibly? Mayor? We only get one part at a time. Yep. <laughs> So uh, let, me, um, let me step back a minute and just say that the, the fundamental question that you're asking with this panel is exactly the reason that I ran for mayor. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want Madison to be Seattle with respect to housing or transportation. I do want us to be Seattle in other ways. <laughs> um, I don't want Madison to be Austin with respect to traffic congestion in particular. I don't want Madison to be DC with respect to um, the shift in demographics and the loss of people of color. I mean, there's a number of, of cities that we can look at around the country and learn from um, and look back a decade or two. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's uh, one of the things that we need to do to, to get to your question is, and we have started to do, is to talk to other cities and ask, what do you wish you had done a decade or two ago about these fundamental problems. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, that's, that's the question in yeah. some ways. Um, but in terms of really specific infrastructure investments, um, we have to be investing in housing. Um, we have, it, here's a, a really interesting fact. So between um, 2007 and 2015, nine out of 10 of new Madisonians were renters. Nine out of 10. So we need a lot more right. rental housing stock. And in that same time period, we went from a 5.6 vacancy rate to a 2.8. Hmm. And rents went up, and here, here we are in the housing crisis that we have. So we have to invest in housing. We have to invest in transit, because as you point out, we're already congested on our main arterials through the isthmus in particular, um, and we, literally cannot accommodate, if, if all of the new growth, and you, you cited the numbers, if that all comes true, we will have at least 800,000 new trips in Madison. We can't fit those. Right. If, the, if that's all in cars, we can't fit that on our existing infrastructure. And so we have choices, right? We can sit in traffic. I don't want that. We can widen all of our roads. Well. I mean, I don't think that uh, Otto Gephardt's going to let us tear down his buildings on East Washington to do that, and I don't want to take people's homes for that. So we, we, can't, we can't go bigger, we can't fit more through, so we have to find a third way, and I think that third way is rapid transit. So I think we have to make the investments now mm -hmm. in the infrastructure changes for transportation, for housing, uh, so that we can start to solve some of these problems. Okay, I'd like to come back to rapid transit in just a little bit. Uh, Ruben, put a little more twist on that, and the, and the mayor referenced housing, and boy, the impact on that with transportation. Sp speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so um, for the audience, uh, you should know that I spent um, 20 years of my career in transportation, and so I sit before you as a hybrid, one who cares about uh, the urban environment, but also uh, one who has spent a lot of time in transportation. And so I think the mayor is exactly right. You know, you can't build yourself out of this situation. If you wait, you're going to stay stuck in traffic, and you're going to be mad because you're going to be stuck in traffic. And so we have to start thinking about, you know, how do we build um, intermodal infrastructure? When I talk about intermodal infrastructure, uh, we can go and we can look in Milwaukee, and you can see they have one intermodal station, but I think the future is going to uh, require us to have multiple intermodal stations. Uh, a hub where um, people can connect uh, with bicycles, where um, city buses and regional buses uh, uh, can connect. Um, we hear a lot about that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> There's so, a big need there. So I, I think we also have to have um, better systems of uh, park and rides uh, so people can get out of their cars. And then we need to have uh, intelligent transportation systems where we're talking about you know, um, traffic flow, uh, transit reliability, and all those things. If we don't start building that type of smart infrastructure and we don't get out of our cars, 
we will have those problems because, um, again, you just can't build yourself out uh, of this. So on the housing infrastructure side, um, we know um, that um, it's, it's, it's expensive uh, to live in this city uh, with a, a vacancy rate around uh, 3% for uh, rental. Uh, and with, um, for African Americans, we're the worst in the nation. Across our nation, home ownership is 45% for black people. Here in Madison, it's 15%. Quite frequently, we hear people talk about Milwaukee uh, being second with around 25 or 26, but we're at 15%. You know, so we've got to make a decision about whether we want people of color uh, to have a place in here. Right now, uh, we have um, South Madison, we have the, the, the uh, uh, east side, you know, here. Um, but if you look at the median incomes of African Americans, they're way lower. Uh, they're getting lower each, each uh, decade. And so it's hard to be here. So I think we have to be intentional about, you know, whether we want this community to be a community that's going to service all people, and then we have to make decisions about um, affordable housing, and we can't just uh, have that affordable housing uh, be on South Park Street. We have to think about, you know, having every uh, community around us uh, help with this for affordable housing crisis. One of the things that we have to face as well is that Madison is inelastic, and uh, we don't have any more land. We're going to have the town of Madison annex and things like that, but we can't annex every uh, neighbor uh, that we have, so we need to really start talking about uh, how we can look at Madison as a metropolis, and I'll talk more about that yeah, yeah. as we go in the conversation. Right on. Kevin. From the perspective of a company that has grown rapidly in, in Madison, we faced a choice a couple of years ago as to where to build our next lab. And we looked all over the country, we looked all over Dane County, and we ultimately chose the southwest side of town in part because that was a neighborhood that we thought um, would be positively Im impacted by having a major employer there. Um, and in doing that, you learn a lot. Actually, in preparing for this panel discussion, it was, it was eye-opening. The, the data around the median income of African American and Latinos in, in this community has, in, over the last 10 plus year period of time, has gone down. Mm -hmm. So at, at Brookings Institute does a prosperity index from uh, the top 100 metro areas. And uh, Madison is 92nd in terms of prosperity and 7th in terms of inclusion. And that inclusion number comes from what is happening to the median income of African American and Latinos. I mean, think about that in this community. So I think one thing that we all have to take, the leaders in this community have to, have to decide is what type of community do we want to have? Do we want to have a community that have haves and have nots? No. I, and I think that's universal, but I don't think that most people realize it. So I think Mayor Satya has quite a challenge that a lot of us in the business community can help out with. We can help out with because the solutions here are going to be public-private solutions. Mm -hmm. They are not, all this development is not going to come out of the mayor's office. It is going to come out of uh, uh, partnerships and collaborations. So, I think that is one big takeaway is, and I see Zach Brandon, um, head of the Chamber of Commerce, sitting in the very first role. That's a great sign. And his leadership has been really energizing over the last five years, is how do we get our companies who have a vested interest, we either um, have employees that can afford to live and work here, or we go someplace else. Right. And we don't want to do that. Right. So, so let me, um, I'd ask Zach this question, but I, I, you're not on the panel, so I'm not going to ask you this question. <laughs> um, Ruben, I'm going to pick up on a comment okay. you had made. Um, and let's, let's talk a little bit about when we refer to Madison. Madison is Madison, but Madison really includes, as we think about it holistically, Middleton and Verona and a broader area and how we all really need to function together. Mayor, I want to ask you a question about how we might work with those cities together, but Ruben, can you pick up on, on that? Sure. I, I think that uh, we're not um, Mayberry, you know, uh, anymore. We're not some small town. And we got to remember uh, that Madison is uh, a metropolis. 
And, and it only takes you to drive down the, the belt line in the morning about to see that you have a lot of people coming in from the suburbs, but at the same time, you have a lot of people going from Madison into the suburbs for jobs. And so to find solutions to um, uh, uh, what the challenges that we have, we have to look for um, solutions in the metropolis. And, and so that would include our suburban partners and figuring out how we can solve these problems uh, with them. But we also have to come to uh, this understanding about, you know, how do we get to uh, metropolis wins, right? So when uh, uh, Epic locates in uh, Verona, uh, that shouldn't be, uh, there shouldn't be jealousy or anything like that. That's a win for the metropolis, right? Because some of those individuals are gonna buy condominiums in uh, Madison, um, they're going to actually um, use our airport, you know, quite frequently. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a win-win situation. So we have to start thinking about, you know, how we can do it together. When the jobs are in um, Verona and other places, um, we can't just think about how do we make transit efficient within Madison. In the metropolis, the jobs are on the fringe. And so as the mayor is thinking about an efficient transit system like they've done in Sun, with Sun Prairie, you've got to, you know, figure out how you make those connections because if you don't make those connections uh, uh, through transit, people are going to get in their cars and go. You know, a winning situation is uh, also, uh, now when we just look at the city, uh, when you have an exact locate uh, in an area that is um, depressed and has a, a tremendous amount of needs and, and provide, you know, uh, a concerted effort to um, make jobs sustainable uh, for, for that neighborhood. So we have good neighbors and, and we have um, people that mean well in Madison, but we have to mean well for the metropolis because those folks down there today who are um, downtown for farmer's market, they're not just coming from Madison, they're coming from around the metropolis. In August, when you're eating corn at the Corn Fest uh, and supporting Sun Prairie, you know, it's just not Sun Prairie people, it's the metropolis. And so we have to start thinking about regional and metropolis wins and know that when the peripheral does well, we do well. Our economy is not uh, defined by jurisdic jurisdictional boundaries, even though sometimes our public policy debates are. Um, you know, people define uh, the boundaries by how they act economically. They're going to go to all these communities and, and act. So the economy is not constrained, even though public policy uh, might be. So we have to start thinking that way, not just thinking about Madison, but thinking about the metropolis. We are so fortunate to have you in our community. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor, can you pick up on that? Yeah, so it, I completely agree with you. Um, I think it's really critical for us to be thinking about a region um, in a lot of different ways. So, you know, certainly in terms of transportation, in terms of our economy, in terms of our housing market, in terms of our environment, in terms of stormwater. I mean, there's a number of ways where we have to be thinking regionally. And, and, um, and I'm happy to say that we are in a number of those areas. I, since um, getting sworn in, I have met with all of the surrounding mayors um, mm. and had really good conversations with them about our shared priorities. Um, and it, particularly with respect to transportation, we do have technically a regional transportation system now because we provide, Madison Metro provides bus service to every surrounding community except Monona. And I'm happy to say that we're in conversations with Monona about that. Um, we just started our service to Sun Prairie and um, you know, sitting down with Mayor Esser, he said to me, um, I will take as many buses as you can give me. Um, so we know that there is a strong demand regionally and we know that our transit service has to follow where our employers are because it's critical for people to have access to employment. I believe that our system has to be a fully regional system. When we build rapid transit, it has to be regional. There is no other alternative. If we, if we can't make it regional, we're not serving the people we need to serve. The, uh, the struggle is that we have been, frankly, underinvesting in transit in Madison for decades. So we were stuck in this place, and I, I'm sure you all are familiar with the bus barn down in East Washington. It is designed to hold 160 buses. We own 218 buses. So already 
we don't have enough capacity for the vehicles that we have. Not to mention the vehicles we will need for rapid transit and any expansion to Sun Prairie or more buses down to Epic, which by the way wants more buses as well, or to give you better bus service for your employees. Or I mean, go down the list of needs, right? So we've been stuck in this loop of people want transit, but we can't give it to them because we literally can't buy any more buses. Um, so we are, I'm happy to say, investing um, to fix that problem and to get uh, past that gridlock. Um, and uh, you know, there's a number of other things that are in my capital budget that will allow us to move towards a regional system. But it is going to take, I think, all of the regional governments um, understanding the need mm -hmm. and being willing to make the investment um, and to cooperate around a system, which I, I'm really hopeful about based on the conversation that That's I've had. That's fantastic. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I had a, uh, Kevin, I'm coming to you next. Um, I couldn't help but think, all right, Kevin's stuck in, in Germany and he's traveling all night long. He's under stress, so he's in a weakened state. So I was thinking, maybe I'd take advantage of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I, I had a, a, a chat with my best friend in, in Seattle just a couple of days ago, and, I, and he's getting married today, and I couldn't be at his wedding because of this panel. And he said, um, you know, we grew up in Seattle together professionally, and he, and he said, wow, you're, you're going to be on a stage talking about these issues with policymakers, with a uh, budding titan of industry, with the representatives of, of um, a broad swath of constituents, and you're up on a stage talking about that publicly. It, we didn't see that in Seattle. And he, his deep kudos and appreciation for what we're doing here, I just, I just want to say that. It just really, it struck me. So in the vein of that, you know, this is a public-private um, panel. Um, as you bridge, certainly you're in, in Madison, but you're, you know, they're, Verona's right there across the way, and you think about um, you're having to bridge across multiple communities, you're trying to find as many employees as you can. What's the role of industry in trying to resolve these kinds of questions? Because it, it's not just a public answer. No, I, I think that's right. I grew up in Flint, Michigan, in a neighborhood called Civic Park. And Civic Park was built, um, it started to be built in 1919, uh, so it's uh, 100 years ago. And it was built by General Motors. And, and there were 450 homes, and that neighborhood was a really vibrant uh, uh, area with parks and a uh, public swimming pool and bowling alley and uh, elementary school. And uh, that was built by General Motors because they didn't have enough housing for people. And so that got me thinking, and uh, I met with uh, Mayor Satya, and, and we talked about this. How can we start to play a role in making sure that there is housing for employees? Because it's a real problem. So here are the numbers. Uh, we moved to $15 an hour starting uh, salary uh, maybe four years ago when we started to hire a large number of hourly employees. And today we have... 1,800 employees in Dane County, um, 2,700 uh, around the country. Um, of those 1,800, 1,300 are hourly employees starting at $15 an hour, moving to $20 an hour, 5% uh, target bonus, 12,750 uh, in initial equity grant, health insurance, really good health insurance with uh, um, very low uh, deductibles. Um, but the cash component of that, every other week is $900 for, and the median price for an, a one bedroom apartment is $1,175. How does that math work? Right. Um, you need two people in a, in a home making decent um, starting wages to, to be able to afford to put a roof over your head. Or if you live on the north side of Madison, how do you get from the north side of Madison to our location? It's probably an hour. Easily, maybe more. Yeah. yeah. So we have to play a role. And I think that if we play a role, uh, and when I say we, all the uh, companies uh, in Madison, well, we'll all be better off for it. We'll be stronger companies. And if we're stronger companies, we will have a stronger Madison. 
But that takes a, a, a tremendous effort because the housing stock, over the last, I think it's six years, 25,000 units have been built with a deficit during that time period of 11,000 units. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and every year we need more. Right, so we're behind and we're getting farther behind unless we do something drastically differently. Yeah. So I'll throw out an idea that I, I, one of the proposed solutions for ideas like this is uh, you know, can you build uh, uh, additional units in your neighborhood, behind your home? In Chicago, uh, my wife Sheila and I lived in a, a little uh, cottage house behind a, a main house when we first got married. Should people be able to do that? Well, most Neighbors are going to say, no, not in my neighborhood. Right. So how do we convince people? Because people ultimately don't make decisions that are against their own interests. How do you get people behind an idea because it is in your interest? In fact, they won't even hear you until they understand how it's good for them. Well, show them the pictures of Seattle Mm -hmm. and show how it's going to degrade their quality of life unless we start to solve this housing problem and a transportation problem. And I wanna thank the mayor for, for making this such a high priority and for Paul and uh, Cap Times for put, pulling this panel together because I, I, I really wasn't aware of how serious this problem is. Amen. Can I follow up on that? Yeah. Because I, mean. I, I think, it, it, Ruben, you said something earlier, we're, we're not growing, our boundaries aren't um, you know, going out so we have to work with the region and then um, you know, to Kevin, to your question about um, how do we help people understand what's in their best interest with respect to housing, the, the city is um, very close to knowing exactly where our long-term boundaries are going to be, right? We are going to annex the town of Madison. That's going to happen. There's a few other places around the edges where we're not 100% certain uh, what's the boundary going to be between us and a a village, uh, for example, but we're very close to it. So we know the land that we have, right? And we know that if, if we grow to the extent that we are projected to, and, and I would say want to grow, that we have got to accept a higher density of housing units in the city of Madison. And I think about it um, on a continuum. Yes, thank you. <laughs> we have got to accept that. So, and, and it doesn't mean that we're going to tear down every single family neighborhood and build high rises. That's not what we talk about when we're talking about density. It could be that you build a backyard cottage or a granny flat. And by the way, you can do that in most places in Madison now. It's just a conditional use permit. Um, so, or it might be on our major transportation routes that we are building high-rise apartments or condos, right? It, 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 you have to look at the context and what kind of density is appropriate in that context. But we have got to accept as a community that people need some place to live. That we want to live in a community where nurses and firefighters and baristas and your folks that work in the lab and, and you know, mail carriers, I mean, go down the list. These people need to live in our community. Artists yeah. need to be able to live in our community. Yeah. And that will not be possible if we don't build more housing. Right. Yeah. So, so this question had to deal with public-private partnerships. And I will tell you that the private sector can't sit on the sideline and just be watching this thing happen and just think that all the solutions are gonna come from government and nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And Kevin is modest because um, exact science understands that. And I think the reason that they're gonna be super successful, continue to be super successful in this community is because they don't have to be compelled uh, to have inclusivity. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody is making them uh, have a diversified workforce or going into um, challenging neighborhoods. They're running towards the fire, not running away from the fire and saying, and they're not looking for mm-hmm. a lot of attention and, and doing that. Mm-hmm. And, and those corporations that take on social responsibility to say that we can make a difference too 
are the corporations that we need to have here yeah. and that they're intentional about making sure um, that they're taking advantage of all the resources, human resources that we have in the community. So I want to publicly say thank you because we have a great partnership with you and it has paid off in dividends. The last training class that we had yeah. for exact science, he hired 100 percent of the workers. We have a cohort going on right now and nobody's making you do that. You guys are doing it because it's the right thing for Madison. Yeah. Thank you, Ruben. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. yeah, I'm going to pile on. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, in, in coming here, uh, having watched Microsoft out over in Redmond do their thing, um, and looking around at some other companies around the area, then then all of a sudden, Exact shows up, and you're booming, and and people say, well, you know, the bigger the companies get, that's what's driving prices up. But you're paying, you're leading the way on the salary levels, you're leading the way in inclusivity, you've given stock to your employees, yep. you're covering educational expenses to them. And so to the extent prices are going up, you are sharing the wealth that you are creating. And yeah. it is phenomenal, Thank you. really phenomenal. So maybe the answer to your question is that everybody should be like Kevin. Well, it's not right. a bad answer. Um, but I, I, we should all create billion dollar companies. You there bet. you go. <laughs> In Madison. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that, that there is a role um, for the private sector to play. Um, in creating additional housing, whether that's um, officially affordable or not. Um, and I think that there's, I'm excited that there is a private sector group that is talking about how to create more investment in affordable housing in Madison. That's a really good sign. Um, I'm excited by the conversation that you and I had around the possibility of employer assisted housing and what that looks like, not just for exact, but for other employers in the community. And I, I wanna say publicly that I'm really excited by the support that we have gotten on increased investment in transit from folks like the Chamber and Downtown Madison, Inc. I think that the business community is really acknowledging the importance of these investments in both housing and transit. And um, now we're going to need more and have more conversations. And one thing that I'm saying to every employer I talk with is, do you offer a subsidized bus pass as part of your employment benefit? Because if you don't, you should. We've got a great program for that at Metro. Um, but I, I think that it is something that we have to do together um, to, if we really want to solve these problems. Well, and I think that's one of the special things about the, the community here is the business leaders, whether they're involved in the Chamber of Commerce, they're involved in United Way, they really care about the community. Uh, and um, that's where I think the opportunity is. If we could pull together the uh, real estate developers and the lenders and the builders um, and the community organizations, and your staff, and, and bring people together and say, how are we gonna to start to address this gap in housing? What parts of the city should we be building in? What programs are accessible? Uh, I know Rich Lynch at Findorf, we sat down and had coffee a couple of weeks ago, they're putting together a $25 million fund to help seed the construction of, of more housing. I mean, Rich is an amazing guy, and an incredible resource for the community. How can we, pull Rich in to get him to help lead the way here. Because people do care. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, everybody. The, uh, Paul, I, I think you under budgeted us time. This is a <laughs> remarkable number of questions coming from the audience. So um, come about um, 6 o'clock, if you don't mind ordering some pizzas. That would be really good. Um, I was going to I was going to ask uh, Mayor about rapid transit, but there's a question from the audience. I'm going to pose it um, from the from the question on the card. Um, do you define rapid transit as light rail or only as buses? If the latter, why do you think that that is a better transportation solution? Short answer, cost. Uh, seriously, I define, uh, so bus rapid transit, for those of you who don't know, is uh, I think a really exciting approach to transit. It uses, uh, I call them double long, but technically they're articulated buses. Um, and so there's more capacity, they, uh, it has fewer stops, um, it comes more frequently, it travels more quickly because uh, you, have, uh, you pay at the station um, instead of paying on the bus, so you don't have to do the swipe, swipe, card, not valid, card, not valid, and you're standing there for five minutes. I take the bus a lot. Um, and so anyway, you, you pay on the station, you walk, all the doors open, you walk onto the bus, 
Um, it goes quickly. Um, we, it has, in many uh, places, a dedicated lanes. In other places, a queue jump. It can change the stoplight so that it gets signal price priority. And anyway, there's a whole suite of things that mean that these things just go faster. Why not rail in Madison? Because we live on an isthmus. There's just, we just literally don't have the right of way for it. And it's, the cost is multiple times more than a bus solution. Now, do we need rail from Madison to Milwaukee and to Minneapolis? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But if we wait to have the money to invest in light rail in Madison, we will not have the rapid transit that we need soon enough. And frankly, we need it yesterday. So we have to move forward with the solutions that are going to work for us now. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, there was a number of light rail questions, by the way, so I think we've tackled a, a, a gaggle right there. Um, there was a question around how can we engage business investments in a substantial way. Um, and we touched on that, and I, and I can also say that uh, Kevin and I have been chatting about even what, you know, WARFs as a nonprofit organization, our, our uh, IRS designation is to support the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, specifically, but are there things that even we could do to help uh, coalesce some activities with industry. Um, I will take that to heart very much so. I would very much like to join you in rallying industry to help um, create fuel to make this happen. Um, here's a question. It's um, how do we build transportation infrastructure while rapidly decarbonizing at the same time? Uh, that's a great question and one that I'm pretty passionate about. So um, first of all, transit is decarbonizing to the extent that it moves people out of their individual cars um, and so that you have uh, fewer emissions per person if you're taking the bus. Um, and second of all, it's my intention and the city is moving in this direction to have a bus rapid transit system be a fully electric fleet. Um, we are testing, we're going to test electric buses now um, to make sure that they can stand up to what we need them to stand up to, including our winters. Um, but these are, they are being used in other places in the country with success, and uh, I think that the way forward for us is fully electric. There's going to be a transition period, and we will be looking at whether or not we can use biodiesel uh, for the existing <coughs> diesel buses. Um, but yes, it's, it is critically important that uh, as we transition to a more transit-based transportation system, that we also transition to a decreased or zero carbon transportation system. Can I quick add to that? Yes, sir. So one, one of the things that we have to do is start making people pay for um, the true cost of uh, transportation. And as the city grows and as the population grows, if you don't want to have to be stuck in time, people need to pay for um, peak, peak uh, driving. And so in New York and places like that, they have congestion pricing. So if you want to drive your car, you know, during the times that it's totally congested, then you've got to pay, you know, a little bit more. And then as we talk about, you know, um, growing um, between now and 2050, we need to look at other ways uh, to generate revenue and, and also be, to be able to assign uh, people appropriately um, charges to when they use their car. So there's going to be like potentially subscription charges, almost like your um, cable TV. So if, you know, again, if you're using the roads more than somebody else, you know, at some point we have the technology to say that those folks who are using uh, the uh, freeway system the most, the highway system the most, the roads the most, they should pay the most. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> because we do need to generate revenue and, and these systems don't pay for themselves. And so it, one of the core challenges that, that we at the city are facing is how do we fund the kind of transit that we need. And that's um, it's a struggle, frankly, and, and I'm open to any ideas that anybody has about that. Um, but, you know, we could start just with charging the true cost of parking. Okay, I'm going to change the topics a little bit, um, or the focus. And I'm gonna, we're going to turn our attention a little bit to education. Um, and I'm going to take the liberty in interpreting this question in a way that I want to interpret it. <laughs> <clears throat> and, Moderator's prerogative. <laughs> and uh, w when, when we think about public schools, certainly we think of uh, K through 12, but we need to be thinking about adult education, certification, uh, re-education, and those kinds of things. So I'm gonna pose the question now. Please think about it in that context. 
Um, I don't believe we can continue to be a great city without maintaining great public schools. I fear our schools are slipping. What can we do to improve the situation? Can I just take an editorial moment? Because the, the, the challenge, both for the school district, um, which, just so we're all clear, is not run by the city, um, but it is critical to our success, um, and the challenge for UW, challenge for Madison College, challenge for all of these issues uh, is in part funding. And we are all deeply constrained by the state in how much revenue we can raise. And that has been, frankly, across multiple gubernatorial administrations, but it got a lot worse in the last administration. And so the school district is very constrained in how much they can invest uh, in our public schools, which is what better investment could we make, right? That's the future of our young people, of our city, of our nation. Um, and yet their hands are tied by the state. And I, um, my hands are tied by the state and it's incredibly frustrating. Um, so yes, the schools are absolutely critical to the future of our city. And we collectively in Madison, in Dane County and in the state of Wisconsin have to commit to making the investments that we need to make and we need to send a loud and clear message to our state government that they need to let us make those investments. So I'll take a somewhat uh, different approach. Um, I think that we have to make sure that every student that walks through the door, I don't care if they're homeless, I don't care if they're black, I don't care if they're white, I don't care if they're poor, teachers have to be able to teach those individuals. A lot of times students come into the classroom and they have the trauma and the drama of their situation. If a kid is hungry, uh, that teacher has to know how to use community resources to get that kid uh, comfortable uh, in that class. And, and until we are able to teach among tr uh, beyond trauma and all those other social and economic factors, I don't think that we're gonna get to where we need to be. And now, last year I came uh, to the education program here on campus and I looked uh, at all the students that were in that program because they were having a special program, and there were than one African American teacher in, in, that, in, in that group. And I understand that you know, Madison is uh, the number one public education uh, institution in the country, and number three uh, for all, uh, but we have to be able to diversify the students that are coming in that program, and some of these um, kids of color, they need to see um, teachers of color. Mm -hmm. and, and teachers of color is not the only solution because some of the teachers of color may not have the, the um, cultural competence sometimes necessary to kind of get students through. But teachers have to have the ability to teach those individuals and make them feel like they can learn no matter where they come from. And so we got some work to do. Yeah, right on. Um, the three of us took liberties with that question. Kevin, do you want to well, I feel very, very strongly about this. Gr growing up in the Flint public school system, w we got a tremendous education. And it was, uh, the schools that I went to were at least 50% uh, African American, and we had great teachers, and we paid better then. And look, you, you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. And so when are we gonna decide what kind of society do we wanna be? It's going to be defined by how well we educate uh, people. And then there are a lot of incredible things about Madison. And I think one of the most incredible things about the education uh, in, in this community is Schools of Hope, that United Way um, yeah. has been doing for, what, 20-some years? Oh, yes, yeah. And among the uh, kids of color who, in the reading and the math elements of that program, there are about 1,000 volunteers in each of those two programs, you see almost an elimination of that racial reading gap and the math gap, as measured by reading skill at, at, at third grade and uh, algebra ready by 10th grade. Let's expand that, because it really does work. So maybe we are limited, but we know that there are some things, if, if the community knew that more, I bet you could go to 2,000 
uh, and 2,000 volunteers for each of those programs. Um, I've done that. It's an incredibly rewarding. If uh, employers knew that, you could give people time off at lunch to, to go and do it. It makes a difference. Yeah. Here, I have to say that, that Ruben is being modest here now, so I'm going to call you out a little bit because I think that the adult education work that the Urban League does is a tremendous contribution to our community. Thank you. Um, and the training programs that you have that directly connect people with employers, like Exact, um, but with many other employers as well, is really important in terms of sort of the other half of this equation, right? And getting families stabilized with a good income, a good job, a career pathway, um, so that their kids aren't coming to school hungry. And I, so I, I just want to recognize the good work that the Urban League is doing around this. Thank you. It, Amen. It really is amazing. Uh, look, we, look we, we do this because we need good employees. And uh, the Urban League delivers to us really great people that come to work for Exact Sciences. With a, um, with a training program and the resources in a way that we can do that on our own. And Thank so you. thanks, Ruben, for everything that yeah. you're doing as a partner. All right. I'm going to, um, I'm going to end it there. And I... And I um, let me say that the questions, as I read through them, they're, they're, there's not a lot of overlap. There's a lot of outstanding questions. Thank you, everybody. And what that says to me, and I deeply believe this, is it's not a bunch of talking heads who come up with answers. It's, a, it's us. We collectively, as a community, need to rally ourselves and talk constantly and come up with solutions because we are in this as neighbors, as friends, as family members. Uh, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to each other, uh, and we owe it certainly to all the people who, who need a helping hand, and we, uh, we will make this community a better one than any, any other one in the country. So let me, let me um, also give a, just a quick word of thanks for your not using a single-use plastic bottle. Thank you. <laughs> You've got to walk the talk. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that, Brian. Everybody, let's give a, a, a round of applause, and thanks to everybody. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Can I see the questions? Yeah, you can have them all.